4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. On this edition, brothers crossing cultural borders, a duo gaining fans with hits in Mandarin and Cantonese, but these guys aren't even Chinese. Breaking stereotypes by breaking bones, one woman's fight against discrimination by literally battling her way to the top and exceeding expectations. The odds stacked against her, how this woman doesn't let blindness block her from being the best in her field. I'm Barnaby Lowe, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. The world is becoming ever more multicultural, and here in Asia, influences from other parts of the globe can be found in everything from politics to pop culture. Two brothers from Macau have taken the definition of global citizen to the next level and by doing so have carved out a unique identity of their own. I had a chance to sit down with them in Hong Kong. A song for their mother, in English, and Chinese. Twin brothers Julio and Dino Wakonchi are a classic mix of East and West. Effortlessly switching between languages and breaking cultural barriers. Their striking good looks and ability to sing and write songs have earned Solar, as they're known, a strong fan base, mostly in Chinese communities all across Asia. But what many might find surprising is that they're not Chinese at all. The Asian in us is really through my mom, and she's from this ethnic tribe called the Karen people, right. which from Burma, Myanmar, and so we have actually Karen blood. Yeah, and our father uh, was from Italy. They were born and raised in Macau, at the time a Portuguese colony. It's now part of China. Portuguese is one of the languages that Giulio and Dino can speak fluently, along with English, Italian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, and French. They can perform it all and say their love for music was instilled since birth. We've pretty much always uh, loved singing since we were babies, according to our mom. She, we were always singing and uh, she encouraged us to, to sing and uh, she would buy us a lot of uh, little instruments, you know, these plastic ones like harmonicas and little keyboards, anything just, just to keep our curiosity going. They taught themselves how to play instruments, having no professional training. I've had a lot of friends who were musicians who were older than, than we were that uh, were very happy to show us, you know, a few things. So we took whatever we could from whoever we met. So we're not uh, formally trained musicians, uh, which is also why we, we, we have this certain rawness and very uh, naive approach to, to the way we perform and the way we write. But the characteristic that makes Solar so unique has also presented challenges by others trying to fit them into a certain mold. We went to high school and, uh, and, uh, and the lowest class there was primary five, I think, for us, right? So when we went in there, that was, it was a school with 2,000 kids and then that was predominantly Chinese. That's when we started being called Kwai Zai. Cantonese for white boys. But it was quite the opposite when the brothers left Macau at 17 to live with relatives in Italy. It was there that they first tried to make music for a living. I remember meeting, uh, the, we, we met a producer. We were, uh, at that time we were still signed to EMI and uh, we went into the studio and the first time we meet this producer, his first comment was, gosh, you guys are tall. I thought Chinese were shorter than this. <laughs> and it was his first comment and I was thinking, since when have we you become Chinese? <laughs> yeah. we're, in good hands. we're in good hands here. <laughs> they called themselves Solar, their mother's surname as a tribute to her, and released a single sung in Italian. They recorded two albums, one in Italian and one in English, 
but neither made it to store shelves. People in Italy didn't quite know what to make of the Asian-looking duo and their music. We were quite relieved when nothing came of it because we felt the songs were very uh, immature and uh, at, at all levels and we were still very immature as artists and we still needed to, to, to give it time, you know, to, to go out there and, and play more. So they moved to London to mature as musicians. Solar spent two years playing in bars and clubs on the underground scene. Then it was back to Asia, to Hong Kong, and the competitive world of canto pop. Okay, we left Europe, we left Italy, because they kind of expected us to sing Italian, and said, oh, okay, we'll try it, and it didn't really work. We came over here, and we were afraid the same thing was gonna happen, and, and it did. They said, no, I think you guys are great, but you need to sing in Cantonese. This time, they made a connection with audiences. People in Hong Kong were interested and impressed with the twin Guai Zais who could sing in Cantonese. I woke up and found your Solar signed with Hummingbird Music and promoted their diversity releasing Double Surround Sound in 2005, followed later the same year with Intuition. But when disputes arose with the record label, the brothers walked away. The move cost them big. In 2009, the Akonchi brothers were ordered to pay Hummingbird more than 650,000 US dollars. The dispute led others in the industry to think the Akonchi brothers were bad news. We had a dry spell. There was a period where nobody was calling us, because, you know, because somehow in the general culture, you don't touch someone who has a legal problem. Damaged goods. Solar became independent and started its own record label, K-Town Records. And going indie gave the brothers a chance to determine their own path. They continued to write their own music, incorporating a mix of rock, folk, and soul. It was their cover of a Hong Kong classic, however, that really caught listeners' attention. Because I was actually in a, in a cab one day and I heard this song on the radio. I heard the chorus, I said, this is an amazing melody. I asked the driver what the name of the song was. He said, I think, and I couldn't remember it until I went to the studio. We talked about it. And uh, this song made us known probably more to the north of China. For some reason, they love this Cantonese song and our version. The song gave Solar a launching pad into the Chinese mainland, going over big with listeners in Guangzhou. Solar released two new albums, Canto in Cantonese, followed up with Vivo in Mandarin and a splash of Italian. Aside from music, Giulio and Dino have also branched into TV, acting and educating. Local Hong Kong broadcasters saw the brothers as the perfect pair to host programs about learning English. They've also hosted cooking shows and even a travel series on their beloved home, Macau. Their identity, through having no one specific identity, helped Solar bounce back from bankruptcy. But at the end of the day, it always goes back to music and the brothers' love of all genres. In the few hours we spent with them in the studio, there was no mistaking. This is their passion. What we normally do is we will just sit, one would choose to sit on one of the instruments and just start playing something. And something comes out of that jam session, so. We jam a lot. We jam a lot. So that's what it is. We, we yeah. don't necessarily say, we're gonna write a song now. We'll just sit down and, 
if there's a commission, say uh, somebody wants a jingle, because we do do that too. We do uh, all sorts of music, right. also soundtracks, and so it's not only Every just like what you know our music. Sing, and when I'm flying through the wind beneath my wings, so it's a little habit we have, yeah. It's like and and it's a lot of fun. Dating around the it's a lot of fun. It, as long as it stays fun, the music will keep coming out. Love is a beautiful thing. But Solar doesn't want to be known solely as musicians. We don't want to define ourselves. I, I think, uh, especially starting from last year, we, we already began this process of seeing what will naturally lead us to, to happiness as opposed to having a great career. I think we, we're doing things that make us happy, and I think that is very important, and that's also the message we give to people. Doing what makes them happy has certainly helped Solar find success. Hey, I'm Thank you. In addition to music, Solar have also become ambassadors of sorts of the English language in Hong Kong, and their fan base continues to grow across Asia and beyond. Coming up next on Assignment Asia. We'll take you to Japan and meet a woman who's literally fought her way to the top. Our stories this week deal with identity, and in Japan, 98.5% of the population is ethnic Japanese. So anyone who is different clearly stands out. For one girl, who wasn't the same as the others, growing up in Japan in the 1970s and 80s was tough. But as Liu Zhao Tzu explains, embracing her unique identity ultimately led her to success in a profession most people don't associate with the typical Japanese woman. It's a holiday in Japan, and the fans have filled the seats. They're here to see their favorite performers. But these J-pop girls, they're just the opening act. This is the main event, and this lady, yes, that's a lady, isn't here to sing. Who's your favorite wrestler? Aja Kong Senshi. Number one. Number Aja Kong Senshi. King Kong. She's here to kick butt. You beat people up for a living. Mm, <laughs> for more than 30 years, Aja Kong has been the queen of Joshi Pure Wrestling, women's pro wrestling in Japan that for decades has had a large and loyal following. Five feet, five inches tall, and 105 kilos, she's arguably Japan's most famous monster heel, a so-called villain in wrestling terms who shows no mercy to her opponent. But sitting down with her at a training gym on the outskirts of Tokyo, Aja Kong reveals a different side of herself. She says the fierce character she plays stems from her childhood as a girl who never fit in. Every day I'd go to school and every day my classmates would ignore me and bully me. Born Erika Shishido in September 1970, her mother was Japanese and her father an African-American military serviceman who left when she was only five. It was bad enough coming from a broken family in a society that frowns on divorce. But being the only mixed-race child at school was especially tough. The other kids wouldn't talk to me. And when they finally did, the boys especially said, you are of mixed blood. You're a half-breed. You are black. By the time she was in fifth grade, the bullying became too much. Just 10 years old, Erica took out her frustrations on the only person she could talk to, her mother. She usually would say, whatever they're saying is unfounded. You shouldn't be ashamed of yourself. It's not your fault. So all you have to do is be brave and just face them every day and be patient. But that's what I'm doing every day. I'm doing exactly what she tells me to do, and every day I go to school and they ignore me and say things about me I don't even want to hear. So on this day, I went to her and said, I'm doing exactly what you said, but they still do this to me. Why did you even have me? Soon as I said that, my mother went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. She pointed the knife at me 
like this. And she said, since I decided to have you, it's up to me to decide to kill you too. As shocking as it was to see her grab a knife, I was even more shocked to see her crying because she had never done that in front of me before. For Erika Shishido, that moment changed everything. She knew she'd have to find a better way to live, and soon she did. It was 1985 and a young pro wrestling tag team called The Crush Scouts had taken Japan by storm, becoming huge in mainstream pop culture and idols for Japanese schoolgirls. For Erika Shishido, now in ninth grade, it was an opportunity to escape the bullying at school and shine. Shishido beat out 2,500 other applicants to make it to the All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling Training School. A year later, she was ready to go pro but the high she was feeling quickly came crashing down. I told the company that I was interested in becoming a babyface because I wanted to be a hero. But then the company told me, you're a half, so you have to become a villain. You're a half, and you're black, so you should feel this hatred towards Japanese people and crush them. She had little choice but to obey. It was do as your bosses tell you, or you're out of a job. So Erika Shishido dyed her hair and put on a painted mask. The villainous Aja Kong was born. My mom fell ill when I was 17. She had a brain hemorrhage, and I was out fighting in these matches feeling, I don't want to do this, playing this role. I wasn't even earning enough to be able to support my mom. So I was thinking, what can I do to cheer her up at the hospital? What can I do to give her courage to fight this illness and make her happy? She was usually watching television late at night when pro wrestling was on, and I found that the way to cheer her up was to let her see me doing well on TV. And I told myself, I decided to become a pro wrestler because I wanted to be famous, and it's a place where I need to make a name for myself. And hiding something about myself was contrary to my purpose, so I decided to use being mixed race as my weapon. Self-acceptance was the key to her success. Fans began to cheer for the villain, and by 1993, Aja Kong was world champion. Now, with nearly three decades of experience, she's paying it forward, coaching newcomers on how to take bumps by showing them how to do it herself. And although considered a veteran, she says Aja Kong has no plans to slow down. But I used to think that if I'm not performing like I did when I was at my best, then I'd quit the next day and have no regrets. But now I think the moment Aja Khan retires will be the moment I die. So I'm not thinking of having a retirement ceremony in this ring, because as long as I'm living, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. What is Aja Khan afraid of? What is Erika Shishido afraid of? To age, to grow older, for Aja Kong too, growing older eventually means death. And in my everyday life, I sometimes fear that. Aja Kong learned through self-acceptance, you can make your dreams come true. For all the children who are feeling that they are different from others and that life is tough because of it, I would like them to know that could be your best weapon. And I also want them to know that you're never alone. There was a time when I thought I was alone in this whole wide world, that nobody was with me. But then I had my mom. And even after I lost my mother, there were other people who came to support me as Aja Khan. And that's why I'm still out here today. In a career as a pro wrestler, you can't win every match. But Aja Khan says she's won the fight of no longer being ashamed and living life on her terms. For I'm in Asia, I'm Liu Zhaochu in Tokyo. Aja Kong rarely breaks out of character. She's still the mean villain who taunts her opponents and breaks the rules. But fans have embraced her after learning of her personal triumph. Now stay with us after the break.
one Chinese woman's story of determination and courage when all the odds seemed stacked against her. Life can be difficult for people with physical disabilities, but one woman in China has refused to let her inability to see stop her from becoming one of the most sought after people in her entire profession. Here's her story in her own words. Chen是一名盲人钢琴调律师 他们准备要一个健康的孩子，所以姥姥把我抱回家，一直把我培养成人。嗯，那个时候他很担心我，养不活我，因为我身体很差，有好多疾病。嗯，反正能活下来也算是个奇迹。就是因为我的资质动作让人看不出来我眼睛看不见所以你们必须比别人先进04年的时候,全球热播导盲线小Q 有助理帮助我
了不了，就是去超市了，这不是。你觉得小梦天珍妮可以说走路我赶走了，但是又感觉到哪儿都不让他走了，哪儿都拒绝导盲犬，所以等于我又有了一个新的领域。嗯，我用了十八年，让大家知道了盲人可以调戏，到现在没人拒绝我们，还都在排我的队。现在我又开始进入一个新的领域，就是导盲犬，让大家接受导盲犬比调戏还难呀。不过目前还好吧，可以说我想去的地方都能去了。嗯，虽然还有一些会拒绝他的地方，但是以后会越来越好。嗯，我记得我小的时候，我姥姥要求我很严，嗯，甚至于比较狠，她总是让我自己去干事情。嗯，才，嗯，锻炼出我现在很独立的性格。嗯、呃，他总是让我自己去买东西，自己去公园玩，自己去学校。我长大了以后，嗯，我才慢慢体会到，长大了没有人永远牵你的手。嗯，在我姥姥去世的时候，他跟我说，其实在我小的时候，我，嗯，去公园去买东西都是他在后边跟着我。我看不见他跟着我，嗯，但是他看得见我，在一个安全范围内，在自己锻炼着自己独立出行。嗯，到现在我很感谢他的培养吧，近似于，嗯，很残忍的培养。如果没有小的时候的吃苦，我想长大了我不会到今天，我也不会是大家的心目中的一个典范吧。我觉得看不见了并不可怕，最可怕的就是自己失去信心。嗯，我总相信一句话：今天不放弃，明天就会有希望。A clear example of how anything is possible if you put your mind to it. Be sure to visit our website, assignment-asia.com, to learn more about all the stories of today's program. You can share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows. That's all for this edition. I'm Barnabilo. Join us again on Assignment Asia.